Hello, everyone, and welcome to this bonus episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast, episode number 104, uh, all about digital accessibility, uh, focusing on the tool uh, AudioEye. Uh, so we have Joel Horwitz, uh, Chief Product Officer from AudioEye, and uh, Dave Jandro, who is uh, uh, at Misericordia University, uh, so he talks about uh, the implementation process that they underwent uh, to utilize AudioEye to uh, vet their websites and make sure that everything is as digitally accessible as possible. So we talk about that and just why this work is so important, especially right now. Um, and we really just give you some some guidance on how to get started with this work. So I uh, really appreciate both uh, Dave and Joel sharing all that they did, uh, ways to connect with their uh, respective organizations and things that I mentioned in the show notes as usual. Um, and we also, uh, just another reminder, wanted to uh, shout out our new merch store. So go check that out. Uh, linked into the uh, episode description as well. Uh, it helps to support the show. So without further ado, after this brief message from our sponsor. This is bonus episode number 104 with Joel Horwitz and Dave Jandro. This episode is sponsored by Degree.me, a one-stop college research tool for students. If you work for a college or university, you'll want to learn all about their ability to connect you with the right students at a budget-friendly price. To find out more, please visit Degree.me slash H-E-G. Super excited to uh, talk about this topic, certainly a very important one and one that I don't think we've given uh, nearly enough attention to on the podcast here. So I uh, really appreciate uh, both you, uh, Dave and Joel, for uh, taking some time out for the show here. So we will start off as, as we always do, though, uh, with some quick intros and professional journeys, uh, since we have to go, do, go through two now, um, I guess just as quick as you can. But, um, you know, we'll start with you, Joel, if you want to give, yeah, just an introduction of yourself and a uh, quick kind of overview of your professional journey of how you got to be where you are today. Hi, yeah, um, this is Joel Horowitz. I'm with AudioI. I'm the chief product officer, and um, I'm excited uh, to be here today. Um, you know, Dustin talking about digital accessibility. Um, my background's in engineering. Uh, I later went on to work for IBM in the digital business group, uh, where I helped um, develop a number of digital offerings where digital accessibility. Um, uh, became uh, a really crucial thing for us there. And that's how I became aware of this uh, important issue for, for everyone, really. Uh, so yeah, thanks again for having me here. Uh, my name is Dave Jandro. I work for Misericordia University in the PC Services Department. I've been in IT for about 30 years, and most of them here at Misericordia have last 26 years. My department handles all of the classroom computing and forward-facing web pages, which is where we're discussing accessibility today. Yes. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll start off then um, just to give folks a little bit of context of uh, explaining a bit exactly what Audio Eye does. So Joel, we'll go to you for this one, um, and just like kind of let you take it. But um, yeah, just explain for folks listening a little bit about what Audio Eye does. Uh, yeah, so Audio Eye is a digital accessibility um, technology platform, and what we do is we um, help um, our clients make their digital content accessible. Uh, we do that through um, our uh, tech, uh, innovative technology platform where um, customers uh, install AudioEye uh, on their website or on their application. Um, and then we're able to run um, a number of you know, standardized tests uh, to uh, really evaluate um, how accessible uh, that digital content is. Um, and then ultimately, we can um, provide ways to uh, fix uh components or broken uh, areas that are, are not accessible um, through our um, certified accessibility experts at AudioEye, um, as well as provide um, source feedback report uh, where there are things that are maybe more structural that need to be um, addressed. And so um, we have uh, two uh, main products, uh, AudioEye Pro, uh, which is now free, uh, as well as AudioEye Managed, um, which you can um, subscribe to um, online. I guess just as like an example to make sure it can make sense in my mind. So would it would it be fair to say like examples of this, you know, in terms of things that would be kind of routinely caught on like a website, for example, would be like the alt text for images or like maybe because I know like the, the contrast can sometimes be something that um, is really important to make sure that things can be clearly seen. So would this be common examples of things that are like kind of uh, flagged I guess, through the platform when uh, it's plugged in? Yeah, I think those are probably what are known, the most known um, these days, especially because um, you've seen um, a significant number of technology companies start to include uh, those types of um, capabilities in their 
uh, in their application. So for example, you know, Microsoft PowerPoint today, uh, when you drop an image, you know, into a presentation, um, it automatically will ask you, you know, to add, you know, some alt text uh, so that a person who's visually impaired could easily, um, you know, understand what what's in that image. And so, um, so yeah, that's one of, of many. In fact, we test for over 400 different um, errors that we uh, that are that are found on a site as well as digital content. So yeah, that's one example, but there are many, many more. Awesome. Yeah, that's really great. And I think because like, yeah, it's certainly, I think, more common or a little bit easier, like, because, you know, for, you know, the blog and the podcast and everything, like, you know, I put images up and, you know, it allows you to put alt text in for images, but it like doesn't require it. So, like, you know, you could be mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, overlooking a lot in those things. And obviously, like, you know, if you're saying like, there's just like hundreds of things that you need to be considerate of and just having something that's optimized to do that obviously is super helpful. And I think even just in my own, you know, own geeky way too, like I've seen in some, um, video games that I play that you can like toggle into like colorblind mode. It was just like, like, Oh my God, well, I didn't even think of that. And just like what obviously is like behind all, you know, we just being able to like toggle this setting. There's obviously so much behind, you know, sort of figuring out like, okay, what are the things that need to be changed and how, and you know, all of that. So um, certainly a lot more complex than uh, folks might, uh, you know, imagine. So, um, but at least, yeah, just some shorthand there, I guess, for a common understanding of the types of things uh, that come up. Yeah, one thing to add, Dustin, um, you know, I think oftentimes when we talk about digital accessibility, it's um, it's it's easier for probably people to understand um, this from the standpoint of physical accessibility. So, you know, think about, um, you know, the physical world and all the different experiences that, you know, people have, like going to well, when we were allowed to go to the office, um, you know, mm-hmm. outside of the age of COVID. Um, but think about buildings, you know, and how, you know, all the various um, experiences there, whether it's, you know, going to a different floor and how you need to, you know, install an elevator, right? Uh, if, if that's um, not already there, or you need to add other, you know, signage or, or braille or other accessibility, um, you know, experiences there. Um, now imagine that kind of in the digital world and, and how, you know, one might approach that it, it becomes, um, you know, a very, um, uh, complex, uh, issue to, to address, uh, more so than even in the physical world. Very good point. So then, you know, we'll kind of zoom in a little bit since, um, David, you had experience with your institution, um, implementing this tool. So if you want to, um, just kind of guide us through, I guess, maybe just like the origins of, you know, realizing like the need and maybe just the size of the task and figuring out, um, you know, sort of what the best way for you to go about, uh, you know, alleviating that would be. Well, Mr. Cordy is built on, on charisms of mercy, service, justice, and hospitality. So accessibility kind of fits right in. And Mm -hmm. from the very beginning of our, our web experience, we've always did our best to make it as accessible as at, at that point we thought possible. And then moving forward through time, you, you took more and more effort to make it accessible to the point that you're required to bring in somebody else to really get at your site to the level of accessibility that is proper to, for being a good citizen. And we had the opportunity through our web partner, um, Final Site, that we approached them and say, listen, we're, we're really concerned about the accessibility of our web page, considering the, the litigations that were headed toward the academic environment. So they, Final Site, actually partners with Audio Eye. So it was very simple from our, our web partner right into to have Audio Eye manage our website. And it's it, it, like Joel said, it's as simple as just dropping some code and, and let it go. We, the process originally took about three months to have audio I look at our site and then turn it over to us to manage and fix things that, that audio I wouldn't have access to like some of our user content. Um, mm-hmm. We recently launched a new web page in July and we are in that process again with audio. I we're nearing the end of the, their look at it and they're going to turn it over to us, which I think we can start accessing our content now to fix. But going back to, to what Joel said earlier, like the, um, alt tags and things on pages, you, you, you don't realize that um, there's so many things on the pages that, that make sense to someone with, with sites, say. For example, people using click here as the only link and someone with low vision or no vision, their screen reader would only say click here with no information to where the link would go. So there's, there are things mm-hmm. that weren't, weren't so intuitive to us until we started to really get deep into the accessibility of our web page. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, yeah, it's those things that uh, 
or just taken for granted because that's even like just more of like yeah like the design versus like just the functionality of like oh well, we have to embed this alt text it's like well no but like yeah like how are you designing the experience you know like that's almost more like yeah kind of philosophical and there's solutions there but you know yeah if there's a lot of presumptions made on the design it can make it that much harder for other folks to be able to access and um, like you said I, you know i was just thinking of like yeah like a university website is gonna have like so many pages and then like yeah like user you know like blogs with content and all this other stuff you know it's so much that you know, at a certain point, it's, you know, just grown to be such a large scale endeavor to like, you know, yeah, vet everything and, you know, know where you're at. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a, kind of a tall order. One, one, one of the things that, that was kind of odd to figure out, you mentioned the alt tags, is everything needs an alt tag, but it doesn't need to say what it is. And that, that was one of the harder things. You have to put in a blank alt tag for things like, say, it was screen candy. It really doesn't provide any information, but you still need to account for it. Well, yeah, because I guess it's just, like when I've done that, it's like, you know, you can just say it's kind of like a decorative image. Like it's not, you know, it's like in a kind of a course environment or something because it could be like, oh, well, this is like something that's pertinent to, you know, you know, like what's on this module page for your course that you need to learn. And sometimes it's just sort of like, you know, essential of like, you know, B-roll or something, you know, and like it's just kind of like, you know, set dressing or something. But I don't know. But yeah, it's so it's so complex. And I mean, we, I'm sure we could yeah, spend a lot of time on this, but I'll kind of just move on to my next question. But um, and we'll start with you on this one, Joel, of just, you know, and we'll go to, to both of you to kind of speak to it. But starting with you, Joel, big question. So take it as you will. But why is this accessibility work so crucial to invest in, especially right now? Certainly, you know, there's a lot going on. There could be a lot of competing priorities. But what to you makes this work so important, especially right now? Yeah, I mean, if you... Um... Yeah, and thanks for the question. I mean, if you if you look at the latest um, CDC report, um, you know, one in four Americans uh, have some form of disability. Um, and when you when I think when most people hear the word disability, they think of you know um, people who may be visually or hearing impaired. But in actuality, it's 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 a much broader spectrum than that. Um, it includes people who are you know the aging community who may have low vision or. Um, you know, color blindness. Um, it includes dyslexia. It includes um, a lot of a lot of um, you know um, um, you know impairments that people um, have. And and so I look at this as um, it's now really a life or death um, you know topic of discussion, right? Because if you really think about one in four, uh, that means practically everyone you know either has someone in their family or knows someone in their family um, who is struggling from you know accessing the web, uh, and, and especially for what I would call some of the key, um, you know, life, uh, experiences or, 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 or needs, uh, day-to-day needs. So for example, um, we had, uh, I'm out here in Portland, Oregon and, uh, here on the West coast, we had some, um, pretty, um, amazing kind of, and scary wildfires going on. And, um, you know, the, the, the government put out, um, a, um, a map of, of the evacuations, uh, you know, phases, and it was like colored red, yellow, and green. And, um, there wasn't enough contrast if you're colorblind. And so if you're looking at this, um, you know, at this graphic, you really wouldn't know when you should evacuate based on the fact that there wasn't enough contrast between these colors. Um, so that's a real problem, right? I mean, you don't know if, um, if you should be leaving your home. And so, um, so that's just one example. Um, you know, unemployment is another example. So, for example, if you um, uh, are, are um, you know, applying for unemployment benefits and, you know, they provide you a PDF that's un- inaccessible, um, then again, you can't apply uh, for unemployment um, to get, you know, uh, help, uh, frankly, when you need it right now. So, you know, the, the COVID, you know, situation um, is extremely accelerating uh, the need for digital accessibility. I'm actually kind of quite surprised that this isn't um, a bigger topic of discussion right now. But in any case, that that's probably the most, you know, near and present kind of concern that we have and why we're doing a lot to try to make this topic um, aware and educate the market on how to actually really address the issue. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the reality. I mean, it's like, it's people's lives and being able to access the information they need to do these crucial things. You know, it's just... Uh, I appreciate the way that you captured it. I kind of just give, hopefully will give people that sense of urgency of understanding, you know, in all aspects of life, it's, you know, you have to kind of, you know, dedicate time and energy and resources into this. Cause I think it, I don't know. And, and it's one of those things where you might not even know, like it, it'd be hard to know how many people 
didn't take advantage of like a resource or information or something because it was inaccessible, you know, and like maybe, you know, feedback does get escalated at times, but you know, you do know it's like, wow, look at all these people that are like accessing our resources. Like, well, do you know how people, how many people aren't, you know, because they can't get, you know, the access that they need because, you know, any of those number of things that you mentioned of just, you know, contrast or just like, cause I know for, um, you know, it's, uh, with like dyslexia, I believe, you know, uh, certain fonts and just the way that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that's presented, you know, makes a major impact. So, yeah, I mean, that, that really puts a really bold uh, kind of bold point on this. So I appreciate you uh, kind of contextualizing that there. But um, I guess then, David, you know, in kind of the educational context, if you want to just kind of uh, put your own bold point on this of just why this work is so crucial to invest in right now. I agree with Joel 100 percent with the just the life and death of it all. Like you could seriously lose your life by not being able to read that map. And that, that was a great, great example in the educational environment. I mean, first is you have to provide the students the ability to learn. That's that, that's the whole reason they're here. So making the online experience as accessible as possible for the student is, is key. Um, and from the web perspective for, for me with the forward facing web pages, you, you need to have the information available to them as, quickly as possible so they can find the information that they're looking for to come here. It's it's truly a business decision that if, if we've all been on web pages before that are just frustrating to, to navigate. So mm-hmm. if you can make your site as clean and concise as possible, you get the person to the information that they need in the quickest amount of time and provide them that information that they can make a, an informed decision to come to Ms. Accordia or what, what major they want to follow. Well, I think then too, I mean, it would be kind of the unfortunate thing where it's like, yeah, like they're, they're you know, I guess in like the worst case scenario, like where my brain was going with this is like, yeah, say a student, you know, is having trouble accessing resources, but like is able to navigate themselves through, they, they find their program, they, you know, figure out their application, that sort of thing. It's like, if they've made the investment in the time and the money and all that, and they're hitting friction points with like their, uh, you know, accessing like support resources at the institution or those sort of things, like, you know, it, it would just end up. Yeah, certainly for probably a fair amount of students that they wouldn't end up enrolling at your institution because they can't access the information that they need. And then even if they do commit and register and all that, they may end up, you know, dropping out or taking a leave because it's just so frustrating and all that. Like they can't, you know, uh, can't get what they need, can't get the answers that they need and everything. So no, exactly. And, and once we have them on campus, it's 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 we have the Office of Teaching Technology that helps our faculty create um, accessible content for online learning. We have a Student Success Center that has the Office of, of Students with Disabilities to handle any issues that come up with uh, students that need help. So it's once they're here, we take care of them very well. But get, the the main thing with the main EDU webpage is getting them here. Yeah, you know, on on, on that point, I mean, that's great to hear, David, that you have. Um that, you know, resource center available. I mean, that's another thing, um, you know, just getting that rapid feedback and be able, you know, being able to help, uh, help folks. And so one of the things actually, um, um, that we also do is we, we, um, provide, um, you know, a help desk, uh, via our accessibility toolbar, uh, on, on the site. And so, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, there, there may be things that, um, you know, aren't, you know, necessarily obvious, right, uh, to to people designing, you know, the content or the site, um, you know, there is some subjectivity there, as we all know, in the creative process. And so um, it's really good, um, I think, in general, to always have a feedback loop. And so, you know, I think that's, you know, kind of thinking through, like I said, the digital kind of experience and, and what it sounds like, you know, Dave, with your Um, you know, center there, how do we, how do we reproduce that? Or how do we recreate that experience online in the digital world? So to your point, um, you know, Dustin, that, you know, they don't just give up, but they actually have, you know, a person uh, that's going to help them, um, you know, navigate an an issue when they do come across it. So I think that's a really important aspect to this is knowing that, you know, software and, and frankly, you know, our ability um, is going to get us pretty far, yet there's always going to be things that, you know, um, the the end user may find that we just didn't, um, we, you know, we didn't catch for whatever reason. So I think that's an important mm-hmm. thing to to think about. Actually, yeah, I mean, you're actually leading right to kind of a brief aside of where my brain was going with all this is almost like that you'd want to create that kind of culture of like, you know, keeping each other honest and really like, you know, empowering people to um, say like, hey, you know, I'm like creating, you know, a new page on my site 
you know, for like a, a new office or a new offering or like this event that we're doing and like kind of have that culture of being like, you know, yeah, there's like a central hub or just, you know, some sort of like process, you know, to allow people to make sure that everything they're doing is as, uh, you know, kind of as universal access and everything. And just having, you know, people kind of catching themselves and kind of thinking of that versus it being like, oh, it's just one person's job at the institution that has to kind of like, you know, bear this burden of like, oh, we got, you know, we got to catalog all the sites that, you know, like what needs to be fixed where and they keep like, you know, more and more blog posts keep going up and they have to keep kind of like, you know, chasing people and chasing the content, uh, uh, addressing it. So it, it makes me think of that as that you'd kind of want that culture um, of any organization where, uh, folks understand what this is, what it means and why it's important so that they, uh, yeah, like the end user can kind of just like help kind of, uh, you know, do some of this work and help make sure like, you know, nothing gets uh, neglected for too long. Yeah, no, I think that that is a big, that is a big part of this, right. Is educating, um, the creatives, you know, and people who are generating the content, um, you know, demystifying what are known as these, you know, WCAG, uh, guidelines, right. They're, they're actually somewhat complex when you go in and read that, read about them. In fact, um, you know, there's even um, certification offered by the IAAP, uh, which many of the folks at, at AudioEye have, um, you know, uh, taken, you know, tested for and, and passed. And so, um, mm-hmm. but when you're, when that's not your, you know, main kind of main job, right, so to speak, um, and your main job is, is uh, you know, creating and delivering, you know, education, right, and, and educating people. Um, you know, how do you make this just part of the fabric, as you said, part of the culture, um, so that, you know, people are, um, not seeing this as like, you know, an extra step or, or like some sort of hurdle that they have to get through. But instead it's like, well, of course, you know, like, um, this is just how you create content now. And the, and the technology platform should really, you know, help with that, not, you know, um, not inhibit that. Right. Well, I'll go to Dave uh, for this next one because I guess the, I know I'll just kind of give you kudos because I know you spoke uh, uh, towards the beginning of this of just kind of uh, this work that you've been doing, you know, felt like it really was like just embedded in your institution's culture. So it kind of felt like a natural progression to, you know, really invest in this. So with that, maybe if there's advice that you have, you know, to give other hired professionals who realize they may have some work to do here of, you know, whether it is trying to kind of cultivate that that culture or how to kind of, you know, rally support if you need it, you know, from other stakeholders. But yeah, just any advice from your experience uh, to other higher ed pros? First and foremost, educate yourself. You know, know, know what you're looking for and what, what needs to be done. Like, like Joel said, the WCAG is, it's so complex and, and difficult. Some things you won't even understand. It's like, what, what am I doing here? So if you can get, if you can embrace it and grasp it and, and educate your users. Now we're lucky enough here that, like I said, it's, it's part of our culture. So we, the, the process that we have for updating web pages, we're distributive. So we might have 150 active users and they're all interested in, is this accessible and, and make sure it works right. But it comes to a clearinghouse of me and a colleague. So they're, they're, we're not just putting stuff up on the page and fixing it later. It kind of comes through and gets pushed out um, pretty accessible. You know, there's some, you miss some things, but, and if you can't educate yourself, you don't have the staffing, just get, get a professional audit. Because that that'll that'll really show you what direction you're headed in with your accessibility, whether it's it's a good audit or, or a poor audit. At least you'll you'll have an understanding. And I guess Joel, just really quick, I mean, any um, any thoughts that you have on this? Of just you know, I guess as much as you're aware of, like kind of working in the ed- education space uh, uh, through Audio Eye, just any advice that you would give, um, you know, about utilizing a platform like this and trying to you know implement something that might feel like it's sort of like. I don't know, an additional thing to do, you know, like it's, you know, it might seem like it's sort of like insurmountable, but I guess, yeah, just any advice about um, this work from your experience? Yeah. I mean, I, I think what Dave said is, is absolutely true. I think um, the first, you know, the first step is, is getting, you know, uh, you know, it's like kind of like um, in the air force, you know, they teach you this idea of the OODA loop, right. Which is, you know, to observe, orient, decide, and then act. Right. And so, you know, I think it's 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 really important to observe, you know, what your culture is like today. And, um, you know, you've seen examples of this in the higher education um, where, you know, large, well-known universities like Harvard or MIT or Berkeley um, have, you know, received um, uh, have been sued, frankly, for for lack of um, accessibility. And, 
you know, some folks um, respond to that by, for example, in Berkeley's case, by taking down all of their content. You know, other folks um, have um, tried to, you know, appeal uh, to the court and and try not to, um, um, you know, make their content accessible. And and others have done, you know, have taken steps to um, really embrace digital accessibility and think about, you know, in the case of what, um, um, you know, Dave has done here is in terms of, you know, really creating a sustainable culture of accessibility. So I think the first the first part is just to observe kind of like, you know, how are you kind of set up and, and what's kind of your your belief system, right, in terms of how this should look like. Um, and then you can orient yourself by, you know, just either going to AudioI or there's plenty of other, you know, free tools out there um, to test your site. You know, DQX has a great tool um, to test your site. AudioI, we have our own, you know, standard tests that you can run to audit your site. So, you know, you got to orient yourself to where you're kind of at on your on your accessibility journey, right? Um, and then after that, it is a decision. Are you going to, are you deciding you're going to, uh, in my opinion, do the right thing and, and make your content accessible to people um, or not, right? Um, and then you can act and you act by, um, you know, there's things you can do right away, like adding an accessibility toolbar um, to your site, which helps with, like we talked about, um, you know, content uh, contrast, uh, you know, uh, looking at font size and, and the types of font for folks with dys uh, dyslexia. In fact, there's like a dyslexic font that you can use. Um, there's a help desk that you can you get with that right away. So I think a lot of folks, you know, in, in the industry sometimes, you know, look at this as a very, you know, black and white sort of thing where you're doing, you know, nothing or you're doing everything. And, you know, my my perspective is um, there's no reason, you know, to to not um, take the first step and, and progress, you know, over kind of perfection. And so you know, I would say in, in those cases, like the right thing to do is, is absolutely um, to get started today. There's no reason to wait um, and, um, and, 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 and start on your path and on your journey to becoming um, a digitally accessible, you know, um, environment uh, for your for your students. Yeah, it's a great, uh, great call to action, being proactive, thinking ahead. And I think, you know, there's such a good opportunity to be like, uh you know, like at the forefront of this versus like trailing behind and like, yeah, I mean, it's just like frustrating to hear if like folks are, you know, or institutions deciding to like kind of like resist or like fight against like, you know, greater accessibility. But it's also, you know, you know, if they're perceived like, oh, well, it's going to be so much work or so much cost or that, you know, and it's like, I mean, like, I feel like it's a, you know, it'd be like time well spent, but I mean. I don't know. You know and it's that idea of like, you know, educating yourself and maybe you are kind of the, you know, the evangelist, like you're the person that is kind of, you know, uh, advocating for this. Um, you know, if you feel really uh, passionate about it, you know, you may need to, you know, dig in with it so you're knowledgeable and can help uh, educate colleagues and that sort of thing. But um, so I guess then um, I'll just be curious really quick. I mean, it could be just be content uh, that you're enjoying um, or just caught your eye recently, but, you know, sort of relevant to this topic. Uh, we'll start with you, Joel. Any resources that you'd want to share that we can include in the show notes for this episode? Yeah, I mean, for sure, um, we um, there's uh, uh, we have our makeitaccessible.org um, site. So this is an area where, you know, if, like I said, if you um, want a really easy way, um, without having to be an accessibility expert to understand, you know, how people with disabilities are perceiving your, your digital content. You can go to make it accessible.org. Um, there's tons of, not just for audio, I, but like I mentioned, like, um, if you're a designer, um, there's a tool there, um, from our friends, uh, called Stark, uh, that actually is a plugin for like Figma or sketch or other, um, you know, designing, uh, even Adobe, I think, uh, XD, I think it is like to, um, you know, at the content creation phase to actually test for things like contrast and font. Right. Um, if you're a developer, I think DQ has a really great, um, you know, portfolio of products for you. And if you're, um, you know, a website builder or, or business person, I think audio is a great, um, way uh, to go there. And so, I would head over to makeitaccessible.org to, to learn more about this important topic um, or head to audioi.com, you know, directly where you can learn um, a lot about um, how we how we think about, um, you know, making content accessible. Um, and then the only thing I would also I would mention is, you know, listen, I mean, um, you know, 
the uh, the person uh, Tony Coelho, who essentially wrote the American Disabilities Act, um, is on our board, and um, and we've we've certainly noticed that um, you know lawsuits are are going up, right? There's about 17 times more uh, lawsuits, um, you know, over the over the last few months um, than than the year prior, and I I do believe that's because there is a lot more attention on universities right now because of, of, of COVID. And so, you know, I don't think people should be hearing this and saying, well, you know, um, I, I don't have to do anything now. I can kind of wait this out. I, I would, I would encourage folks to um, be proactive, you know, um, get started now. Don't wait for, you know, a lawsuit or something, you know, really take it upon yourself to, to get started today and, um, you know, reach out to us at audio. If, if you want help on how to do that. Even just like, yeah, you know, like auditing, kind of seeing where you're at and seeing like, oh, wow, OK, we're in a you know pretty good place. And, you know, here are the things that we need to do or, you know, just understanding like the scope and scale and kind of proceeding accordingly and trying to like, you know, uh, make progress towards the goal of, you know, really making the entirety of your website, uh, you know, kind of uh, accessible to everybody. So, um yeah, I mean, I like just kind of now in this episode, like keep harping on like, get started now, do it now, don't wait. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, all, all good stuff. So um, yeah, then I guess, uh, Dave, any uh, other resources, things that you'd want to make note of any, you know, just like books or um, anything else, I guess that comes to mind that we could uh, link out to in the show notes. Sure. Well, like, like Joel said, there's so many tools out on the, on the web that you can, you can a- use to analyze your page or your contrast. Remember our, our print shop even uses it for um, when it creates actual physical prints to make sure the contrasts are right when they send out a mailer or that backgrounds don't um, bleed and it, the document can actually be read by a like a, a Kurzweil document reader. Um, one, one site that I, I could really say makes a lot of this come down to be very, very easy to understand is davidberman.com. He's, he's in Canada, but they, they have the same um, type of issues with accessibility. And he really brings it down to a very understandable. And um, he they do a lot of webinars and such. And I know that when they, if you do sign up for a webinar, you'll get some time with them that if you have a question on accessibility, you can you can actually talk to them. Matter of fact, that, that one of the documents our print shop sent out was going to send out, we had them run through it just to make sure that it was going to be accessible. So I, that's a really good site to use. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so then we will uh, wrap up the episode as we always do, um, liking to kind of end things with an optimistic uh, tone. So um, we'll start with you, Dave, on this one. Um, what are you looking forward to right now in higher ed? Obviously, it's just a very chaotic time, <laughs> uh, pretty hard to predict how, you know, what's going to happen uh, one day or one month or so to the next. But um, yeah, trying to just, uh, you know, look ahead with optimism. What is, what is something that you are looking forward to? Well, we are certainly looking forward to getting everybody back on campus. Right now, oh, we're in that, we're in that hybrid kind of status. So we have we have students learning completely online. We have students learning in class and online. We've we've completely changed the structure of our learning. You know, with social distancing in classrooms and and combining three rooms into one to using Zoom to uh, get, get people in the classrooms and out of the, the dorm rooms. Um, so I, I really hope we can get back on campus and have that normal uh, collegiate experience. Absolutely. And then, uh, yeah, Joel, uh, what are you looking forward to in higher ed? Yeah, I'm, um, you know, I look at it as um, I'm really excited because I, I hope that, um, you know, where we're going with digital accessibility and with higher education um, overall is, is you know is is providing even more access right to education. Um, I think that's that's the biggest thing that I get excited about is obviously you know we're all um, doing our best uh, to to make the most out of um, you know what's been going on here. Yet I hope as one of the byproducts of this challenging um, situation is that like I said earlier, like we do really consider you know um, the the broader community of folks uh, who need access. Uh, to to digital content, right? And and perhaps there's economies of scale that we're going to find um, by investing in in digital um, experiences, right? Not just you know accessibility, but fr- from a broader sense, right? Of of allowing more people to um, you know get their education, you know, online, um, and and perhaps that would provide um, people with with more flexibility. Um, to to learn right at their at their own pace right and so I'm I'm a big advocate of um, you know 
providing uh, people equal access to um, higher education. I think it's it's um, it's definitely something that I think society benefits from. So you know, without getting too out there, um, that's that's the thing that excites me the most in in terms of what we're doing over here at AudioEye. I'm also very excited with uh, the progress that we're making. Um, frankly, with machine learning and AI, I mean, um, we've automated, um, you know, tens of, of dozens of, um, um, you know, errors that you find on a site now uh, with our technology stack. And so um, hopefully, you know, we're able to continue to um, innovate in this area so that we really can, um, you know, lower the cost and make it even easier for people to make their digital content accessible um, without having, like I said, to be, you know, an absolute, you know, expert or, or developer themselves. So that's, that's where we're headed as a company. Um, you know, and, and I, I think that's, um, you know, that, that's something that gets me very excited, uh, with, with what we're up to. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, thank you both so much for the time and for sharing all that you did. And I think, yeah, I mean, this work is just so important and so crucial to kind of just help, uh, kind of realize that goal and kind of, you know, the positive outcomes for higher ed is like just having it be as accessible as it can for as many people as it can be. Um, and this is just, a such a, uh, important part of that and so crucial right now to be investing in for institutions as, uh, you know, more and more of their presence becomes uh, digital. So, um, you know, we'll have ways to uh, connect with AudioEye and the work that you're doing and uh, all that in the show notes as usual. But uh, yeah, thanks again so much to both of you for uh, taking time out for the podcast. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast.